Brothers and sisters in Christ, ladies and gentlemen, I appreciate again the opportunity to be here tonight to discuss the glorious Bible doctrine of sovereign grace and of election to salvation. I appreciate the words of my opponent, his demeanor, I uh, think he is sincere, although sincerely wrong. And uh, the scriptures tell us, Jesus in John 4, uh, that we are to worship God in spirit and in truth. So if we just do it in spirit but not in truth, we've only got half of it. So you can be sincere but sincerely wrong. Let me get to the questions first that my opponent uh, asked me and my responses. First, he asked me the question, will an elect infant who dies in childbirth be saved eternally in heaven? Yes. Two, could those American Indians you mentioned last night have been saved had a Calvinistic Baptist preached the gospel to them? Yes. Matthew 12, 41 and 42 answers that, as well as Ezekiel 3, uh, verses 4 through 6. Thirdly, he says, is, if my moderator gave someone $1,000 to murder me, would my moderator be directly or indirectly guilty of murder? Indirectly. For, in Jeremiah 18, 4, is the vessel that God began to make the same vessel that he made? Uh, after it left Bruce, the hand of the potter, it became marred in his hand, the text says. And God's elect, of course, became marred in Adam. The vessel that God originally made became marred with the fall into sin, and God recreates the vessel, is what the scriptures teach. Fifthly, he asked, are you among the elect, and how do you know? I know it for the same reason why Paul knew that the Thessalonians were of the elect. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 4 and verse 5, Paul says, Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. Now, Paul, how do you know these Thessalonians are of the elect? For, or because our gospel came not unto you in word only, but in demonstration of the Spirit, and power. So like the Thessalonians, I know I'm one of the elect because I have received the word of God in that same manner. Now further clarification needs to be made by me on those questions. Uh, my friend and honorable opponent can simply ask and um, we'll uh, be happy to enlarge upon it. Uh, the questions for my opponent is, and I'll try to hear I jotted down his answers, why did God choose Naaman, the Syrian leper, for healing while not choosing other lepers in Israel? Bruce, I understand it's not talking about salvation, but like Paul said in Romans 15, 4, whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. And we understand in the Old Testament that God spoke and taught people in parables and types and shadows, examples and ensamples and all those things in figures. Of course, when the high priest went in to sprinkle the blood upon the mercy seat, we know that didn't actually take away sin. It was a picture, however, of the sacrifice of Christ. And so I say there's perfect authority from Scripture to look at this, what's happening with Naaman and apply it to what God does in salvation. Leprosy, I believe, in Scripture is a type of sin, and so when a man is delivered from sin, he's being delivered from a kind of leprosy, a spiritual leprosy of the soul or the mind. So I don't think it's stretching it, Bruce, to apply what took place here. God's operating on the same principle of absolute sovereign mercy. God did not owe any of those lepers anything. He could have not healed any of them. But he chose to heal one. So if we go back to 1 Corinthians 4, 7, who maketh you to differ from another... What could, how could Naaman answer that question? God, why am I different from another? I'm healed, the rest of them are not. Well, he, can, he can't claim any credit for it because, hey, I made myself different from the rest and God is selecting me and therefore healing me. He couldn't do that. Obviously, God made a sovereign choice. I will have healing mercy on whom I will have mercy. So I don't think it's a stress to apply it to salvation. 
And in the passage I quoted last night in Luke 4, where Jesus refers to this experience, and it made the Jews so mad they want to take him out and throw him off the bank, <laughs> he brought up this story, Jesus did. And why? If it wasn't to show that God is sovereign in the dispensing of his gifts, whether it's gifts we enjoy in this life or gifts of salvation and gifts of grace, God is sovereign in the bestowal of them. And so God is the one who makes us to differ from another. That's the point. Second question. If one does not become elect till obeying the gospel, now that's his position. That's not mine nor the position of scripture. But assuming that to be true, if one does not become elect till they obey the gospel or he obeys the gospel, of course this would indicate then that not all are chosen at the same time because people are saved at different times and therefore they are being elected or becoming elected at different times. How do you reconcile this with scripture that indicates all were chosen together? I think he had a difficult time with that. All he could do was get up and say, well, they, the corporate group was, say, was chosen by God, according to Ephesians 1, before the foundation of the world, but not any individual member, so they're really not all chosen at the same time. And yet Paul wrote to the Thessalonians in the very passage we've talked about quite extensively, 2 Thessalonians 2.13, God has from the beginning chosen each one of you to salvation. That again, like Ephesians 1, is indicating they were all chosen at the same time. Thirdly, if a Bible writer want, wanted to express in writing individual election, how would he write it? Well, he couldn't tell us. He, he can't, can't tell us how you would communicate that verbally. He just said he wasn't able to do that. Well, brother, I'll tell you, you can't express it any clearer than the Bible writers expressed it, okay? Uh, four, since Abraham was chosen by God, he didn't deny that. Of course, he's been denying scripture. The Bible says God chose Abraham. And if that's not an individual, <laughs> which proves my point, about individual election. But God chose Abraham, and my question to him, assuming that's scriptural, and it is, since Abraham was chosen by God before the corporate entity of Israel was in existence, which is a fact, the nation of Israel didn't come into existence until later, uh, with the birth of the 12 sons of Jacob, or Israel, what corporate group did he become a part of that made him an elect one? And he quoted... Uh, Matthew 8, 11, as though the kingdom of God was the group that Abraham became part of, and because Abraham became a part of the group, that group, therefore God chose him on that basis. Now, you've got to read a lot into Matthew 8, 11 to get that. First of all, Jesus put that yonder out there into the future. It's not something Abraham entered into in the Old Testament. He said, many shall come from the east and the west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of God. And that's not yet occurred. And I would uh, argue... On the other, uh, just the opposite, that the reason why Abraham will enter into the corporate group called the kingdom of God is because God chose him. And finally, was Paul chosen by God for salvation before his conversion? And like my daddy said, one of his famous expressions in debate, and John and some of them know my dad very well, and that, uh, you know, he just shelled down the corn. <laughs> he just came right up to the lip. Uh, lock, uh, uh, block of salt and licked it and said, no, Paul was not chosen before his salvation. And yet, the passage I cited last night on one of the charts from Acts 22, there were actually two passages, Acts 9 and Acts 22, where Paul is said to be chosen. In Acts 9, uh, and th these, both these expressions come from the mouth of Ananias, to whom Paul went in Damascus and was there for three days before he was baptized. Well, these two expressions from Ananias to Paul in Acts 9, Ananias says he is a chosen vessel, or God says to Ananias, he is a chosen vessel unto me. Notice that he is, not he will become after he's baptized, after he's saved, but he is now. And that statement is made by God to Ananias before, according to you, Paul was saved. So he was an elect person before he was saved. In Acts 22, and it's stated this way, God hath chosen, now here's where Ananias is speaking directly to Paul. Paul, God has chosen thee, and there are three things listed there in that passage. Three things that he has chosen you to experience. One, he's chosen you to know his will. 
That is, to know God and to know his will. Because to know God, uh, God's will is to know God. To know his will, to see that just one, and thirdly, here's the third thing he chose him to, to hear his voice. Now, is that not salvation? Did not Jesus say, my sheep hear my voice? Is that not what salvation? So, obviously, he's choosing Paul to salvation if he's choosing him to know God, to know his will, choosing him to see the Lord Jesus Christ and to hear his voice. That's a choice unto salvation. And yet, all this was said of Saul before, according to you, he was baptized in water. But, you know, not only do those verses teach that Paul was chosen for God for salvation before his conversion, in contradistinction to what... Bruce says he believes. He didn't believe Paul was chosen until after he was saved. But yet the text is very clear, and not only that passage, other passages that I've cited in this debate. For instance, I cited the passage in, uh, I think it's, it's, it's in my notes, or 2 Timothy 2.10, I believe it is, where Paul says, For I endure all things for the sake of the elect ones, that they, the elect ones, may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. So here, people are elect before Paul preaches the gospel to them. And then, of course, going back to 2 Thessalonians 2.13, elected to salvation. Well, obviously, it didn't say salvation to election. That's your view. You want to put salvation, then God will elect you. But notice, Paul says he elected salvation to salvation. Now, listen, you don't have to be a college graduate to understand which comes first in that passage. Elected to salvation. Salvation follows election. It's just that simple. Give me, uh, I think it's chart 56 if you got it finished there, brother. He asked me how God redemptively loves all men. I cited this passage last night, and I'll cite it again, because it answers his question. We both labor, for therefore we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior. You could say, who is the lover of all men, especially as he the lover of the elect. You see that? So there's a general love, but then there's a special love, and really you don't den deny that. Do you believe as a born-again child of God that God loves you more than the wicked who, who is lost? Wouldn't you say God especially loves his bride, that God especially... Look, I love all women, don't you? But I especially love my wife. So really you don't disagree with that. The question that we get into is, like on that chart last night, which comes first? Who loves who first? And 1 John 4, 19 says, we love him because he first loved us. Now, God has a general love to all men, but he has a special love for his elect. I don't deny that. And when you quoted that from my blog, that's what I was expressing, that that's what Paul is teaching there. Give me uh, chart number 57, bro. In Christ. We heard a lot about in Christ. And uh, I had a lot to say about what in Christ means, uh, which hasn't been addressed by uh, Bruce. Now, I know it was in my last speech last night, but he didn't say anything about it in this speech uh, tonight. And I went through a long time of talking about what in Christ means, how in Christ modifies the action of God in choosing, not, is, it's not modifying the pronoun us. If you remember, I brought up other scriptures where it says he created all things in Christ in Colossians 1, and how he, if you put his interpretation on that, it wouldn't make any sense. Well, let's talk about in Christ this morning. Because in connection with 1 Corinthians 1.30 that he brought up last night, that verse says, but of him are you in Christ Jesus. Uh, and let me just read what I got on the chart. This verse, however, contradicts my opponent's position and is in perfect harmony with my position. The verse says that it is of God that we, as individuals, are in Christ. Now, what does of God mean? Does it not mean of his choice and of his work? Remember Romans 9.16, which he brought up and we'll get to uh, tonight, where Paul says, notice, it is not of him. Here we begin this idea of being of him. Okay? 
It is not of him who wills and runs, but of God. So here again, we have of God in 1 Corinthians 1.30, of him are you in Christ, and we have this also in Romans 9.16. Notice how of him that willeth, it's not of him, is contrasted with of God. Paul's saying if it's of God, it's not of you. If it's of you, then it's not of God. That's what Paul's arguing in the passage. It's one or the other, it's not both. Notice also that Paul defines what he means by the preposition of. For something to be of or from something, it would be one, of his choice, of his will and choice, and two, of his running or activity. So with the Pauline definition, let us read 1 Corinthians 1.30. For of or from God the Father's Will, choice, and activity, you are in Christ. And he's also, by saying that, is saying, it is not of or from you who wills, chooses, or acts that you are in Christ. Now let him get a deal with that eisegesis, or exegesis, I should say. Eisegesis is what he's been doing. Exegesis, hopefully, is what I've been doing. Next, chart 58, brother. He asked me also about being saved or in Christ before regeneration. And in answer to Bruce's question on this point, I affirm that election is a spiritual blessing. If I got the right chart. And Bruce, in response, reasoned that this would consequentially or logically put me in the predicament of affirming that we were spiritually blessed or saved before we are in Christ by conversion. Now notice Romans 4.17, how this helps answer his uh, question or his confusion of, uh, uh, about me being in a predicament. It says, as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations, before him whom he believed, even God, who quickens the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were or already were. What Paul is saying is, look, God's in the habit of saying something's already been done when it's not yet technically been done. And we could give a lot of examples of that in Scripture where something is said to be already done that is in the mind of God when it's not yet come to pass. For instance, I could say in Romans 8.30, Paul says, whom he justified, them he glorified, as though it's already happened. And yet we know that none are yet glorified, at least not in body, yet fully glorified. But yet Paul puts it as something already accomplished. God speaks of the elect as already blessed and saved in many passages, and yea, he speaks of them already being in heaven in many places, even before they actually occur. And he does this because with God, it's certain to be done, even though not done. And this is what Paul means when he says that God calls things as already come to pass when they are not yet come to pass. And again, we could give numerous examples of that. 59. So in Christ. Well, first of all, the scriptures show that a person is in Christ in more than one sense. People in Scripture are in Christ from more than one perspective. One is in Christ from before the foundation of the world by the decree of God, that is, through election and predestination. Then one is in Christ when he enters Christ by faith or by regeneration. One is first in Christ in God's mind before he actually is in Christ by regeneration. That is, God's choice of a person before the foundation of the world puts, as far as God's mind and determination is concerned, puts them in Christ virtually. I mean, we didn't exist before the foundation of the world except in the mind of God, but in the mind of God, they were in, viewed as in Christ. Just like before the foundation of the world, God saw people in Adam too before they were actually in Adam, you see. Uh, let me see. Thank you. You didn't get that chart 61 done, the last one, or did you? Uh, 
Uh, we'll save that one. Let me go on. Just take that one off the screen, brother. Now, I want to say, too, uh, before I get into some of the things, more things he said, although a lot of what I'm saying is addressing what he said tonight, he asked uh, me about the elect being in jeopardy before regeneration. You know, he quoted Ephesians 2 about how the uh, Ephesian elect were at one point without God and without hope in the world. And he thinks such ideas as that contradict my idea of election. However, if we think about the experience of the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 27, when Paul, with others, is on a ship, and he ends up being in a terrible cyclone or hurricane, of which God had warned him through an angel that this hurricane is going to come, and there's going to be great peril, great jeopardy. But yet the angel gives Paul the message of God. Look, Paul, even though you're going to be in jeopardy, you're really not going to be in jeopardy. Nobody on this ship's going to die. So you know in the discourse, Bruce, of Acts 27, let me ask you, those people on the ship with Paul, were they in jeopardy or were they not in jeopardy? Okay, that'll answer your question. You see, I would answer, well, from man's perspective, they were in jeopardy. I mean, the danger was real, but knowing the decree of God that, look, I'm not going to allow anyone to die on this ship, no one to perish. They, were, they weren't in jeopardy, so yes and no. It's like this, Bruce. I could say, does the world spin this way clockwise or does it spin counterclockwise? So you can answer that either way. Some of you are looking at that, right? If I'm on the North Pole looking down, which way is it turning? Counterclockwise, isn't it? Now, if I'm under the South Pole looking up and I say, what? Well, it's turning this way, isn't it? It's perspective. From God's perspective, no, the elect are never in jeopardy, just like those people on the ship were never in jeopardy from God's perspective. But was the danger real? Yeah, it was real. So that answers that question. Give me uh, chart number uh, 15, Brother Basil. And by the way, I would love to hear Bruce respond to those two charts I brought up last night and even gave him copies of to take home. Chart number 13, which comes first? Chart number 24, elected to regeneration. I'd love for you to deal with those, uh, Bruce. I think there's people here today who'd like to hear your response to those. So if you get time, address that. Chart number 15, individual election is what we're talking about. Not that we already haven't proven that. Of course, I wouldn't know how to prove it because he doesn't know how to put that in writing. How would you write out a statement affirming individual election? He already said he wouldn't know how to write that in English or in Greek or whatever language. Notice these passages on the book of life. Luke 10, 20. Notwithstanding in this rejoice not, said Jesus our Lord, that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names, your individual names, not just the corporate name of the church now, your individual names are written in heaven. And then in Philippians 4, 3, Paul says, I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women, that's plural, individual women, which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, that's an individual, and with other my fellow laborers whose names, whose individual names are in the book of life. Now, when were these names written in the book of life? Look at the next verse. The beast that thou sawest was, Revelation 17, 8, and is not, and shall ascend out of, out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. So the names were written before the foundation of the world. And obviously then, and they were individual names that were written in the book. Obviously God had to make a choice before the foundation of the world which individual names would be written in that book. So how could you deny individual personal election? And brother, they were all written down at the same time too. You know, this song people sing, there's a new name written down in glory. No, brother, there's no new name written down in glory. They were all written before the foundation of the world. Chart number 16. We're going to look at some other individual examples of people who were chosen. 
In Nehemiah 9-7, really we've already referred to this, how God did choose Abraham and brought us him forth out of Ur the Chaldees. I think another expression in Scripture is God chose Abraham and called him. Well, which came first? Did it say God called Abraham and Abraham heeded the call and therefore God chose him? Or is it the other way around? God chose Abraham and God called him forth out of Ur the Chaldees. So the calling forth of Abraham from that wicked, idolatrous people was a result of God choosing Abraham. There's no record that says there were others in the earth, the counties that God chose and called forth. It was a special particular call, wasn't it? And notice Romans 16, 13. Salute Rufus, brother, that's an individual, chosen in the Lord and his mother and mine. And then in 2 John 1, 1 and 13, John says in his subscription, you know, the heading on his letter where he's writing, here's who I'm writing to like we do, you know. The elder unto the elect lady. And that's singular in the Greek. One lady, one person. And her children, whom I love in the truth. And then verse 13, the children of thy elect sister, the sister of this lady, Greet thee. So here are two individuals, or more, who are individuals who are chosen. And then First Peter, which is not on the screen, but you can turn there if you like. First Peter 5.13, and here I'm reading from the NIV because I believe the King James or authorized version does not translate correctly here. But the NIV says, She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you her greetings, and to- so does my son Mark. Notice that. She who is in Babylon chosen together at the same time with you. And when was that time? Before the foundation of the world, when God wrote the names down in the book of life. Now give me chart 17, brother. And I mentioned this last night, which Bruce has not responded to, but I'm going to bring it up again, this time on a chart form. I said that in the New Testament, oftentimes the word elect is, in fact, the predominant number of times is in the plural number, the elect. So that if you translated uh, more accurately, you would say the elect ones, you see. And depending on the passage, it's either electos or electoi. And it's the chosen form. And in this passage that I've quoted is an example of that. Therefore, I endure all things for the elects. That's accused of plural masculine. Notice, plural masculine, electos, sakes, that they, and see, if you missed it in the Greek, you got the plural pronoun they there, which you ought to tell you in English, that they, the plural, the individual elect ones, may also obtain the salvation with Christ Jesus. Notice how this statement has them elect before they're saved, and the reason why Paul is enduring all these things and going out as a missionary preaching the gospel under great hardship was so that they, the elect, who hadn't been saved yet, will be saved. And uh, I've already said that most of the occurrences of eclectos and eclectoi are in the plural form in the New Testament, meaning elect ones, elect individuals. Each one is chosen, thus individual election. Individual election is what constitutes one a member of the body of Christ. Now, chart number 18. How much time do I have? Well, I'll tell you what. We'll just save that for next time. Let me see what here in his notes. Uh, well, Romans 9, he took up about the whole time with Romans 9. And Romans 9 is what I'll get to in my next speech. But the case of Isaac that I have brought up is mentioned in Romans 9. The question is, what was Isaac being chosen to? I believe he was being chosen to salvation. That doesn't exclude being chosen to other things here in this life, but certainly it included the idea of him being chosen. And I'll just say this in preparation for my remarks in my uh, second speech about this. Bruce, you did exactly what Pat Donahue did here uh, two years ago on talking about the doctrine of election in Romans 9. 
you'll take one verse and say, well, that's not talking about salvation. Yet the very next verse, you'll indicate, well, it is talking about salvation. Now, let's be consistent throughout Romans 9. As we go from verse 4, verse 5, verse 6, verse 7, verse 8, let's watch how, oh, well, this verse doesn't fit my theology, verse 5 done, about eternal salvation. We'll make that not deal with eternal salvation. Oh, but the next verse, you know, is dealing with eternal salvation, and I'll point that out in my next speech. Thank you for your kind attention. We'll take, what, about a 10-minute break? And come back, and Bruce will uh, give his second speech for the evening. Thank you.